Hello, everyone, and welcome to the autoimmune for the ER and a little bit of cancer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in, get this started. So there are hundreds of autoimmune diseases. And as you can see, these are just a few. There are many different named ones and many different ones that we're discovering each and every year. Because of that, I'm not going to go through an ad nauseum list of all the different autoimmune disorders, all their different symptoms, and how and why they work. Instead, I'm going to talk about this as a very broad category. I also want to make sure you understand that autoimmune diseases are still kind of medical mysteries, which is pretty exciting, but it means that there's only a lot of accepted theories and guesses. It doesn't mean that we know 100% of everything. There are some people out there who even think that autoimmune diseases are actually different classes of diseases that we don't quite understand yet, which is why we can't explain one particular disease process and one particular um, symptomatic pathway for all of the autoimmune diseases. I also want you to know that this is a uh, relatively considered to be a new class of medical diseases, unlike the ones that have been around since the Roman times, autoimmune diseases were actually discovered in the 1900s by accident when somebody found an antibody attached to a healthy red blood cell. So let's go on and talk about our quick overview. So I'm gonna do just a very quick and dirty immunology review. We're gonna talk about autoimmune diseases and what they look like as a whole. We're gonna talk about steroids, which is the mainstay of treating an autoimmune disease in the emergency department. And then we're gonna take it one step further and we're gonna talk a little bit about cancer. So quick immunology review. And in case you're not familiar, yes, that picture is coronavirus. It seems to be haunting us now. All right, so the two main components of the immune system is the innate immune system and the adaptive immunity. So these are all the immune system, but you notice that the innate immunity is the stuff that takes hours. If you have a cut or bruise or scrape or get infected right now, those are the ones that are gonna respond within hours. The adaptive, adaptive immunity is the T cells and B cells. These are the ones that take days, but they're gonna last the longest. Those are the ones that we care about when we're talking about autoimmunity. It's gonna be the long lasting for years and years. The B cells make antibodies and the T cells make specific cytokines, which essentially kill other cells. So the main differences here, as we kind of talked about before, is that B cells, they're going to remember things. They're going to make antibodies. They're what we're trying to activate when we give vaccines. So they're one of our best defenses for viral and bacterial immunity. And then our T cells, their job is mostly to just identify different cells that are already infected and then kill that infected cell, as you can see in the picture down here. Now, the way that the T cell does that is it attaches to each individual cell and says, show me your passport. And if it does not recognize the passport, then it says, okay, everything checks out, everything is good. So it has to not recognize the passport and I'll explain that in a minute. If it does recognize it, or if it says, hey, this, this looks a very strange, I've never seen this before, that's when it's gonna attack the cell and make the cell kill itself because it assumes it is under attack. So you have to know that the T cells and the B cells work together. This is important because if just one thing goes wrong, if just the T cells or just the B cells are having problems, if they're sick or if they're not doing their job right, it's going to affect the other cell. So you can see these little pictures that I made that are kind of silly, but you can see that if a T cell brings an antigen to a B cell, it's gonna make um, some auto antibodies against whatever the T cell is bringing to the B cell. And similarly, if the B cell has antibodies that are attacking one particular antigen, the T cell is gonna come by and see all of those antibodies that are attacking something. And it says, hey, this must be bad. I trust my friend, the B cell. And so it's going to attack that antigen as well. And it's gonna take that antigen to other B cells and it's gonna perpetuate the cycle. 
this is an important part of autoimmunity. So only takes one to go completely wrong and activate the entire immune system. This is why autoimmune disorders are so dang hard to stop once it starts. Now, this is the part where I was talking about the passport. We have something called tolerance, immune tolerance to ourselves. That's right, we tolerate ourselves as it turns out. <laughs> so what we do is the immune cells actually go through a training process when we're very little and when the immune cells are brand new in the bone marrow, the spleen and the thymus. And what they're doing is they're being trained to not recognize or not activate with our self proteins. So it doesn't recognize the good passports, which means it's almost like those cells are invisible to it. If it does recognize and say, this isn't something I'm trained to ignore, that's when it identifies the non-self or the foreign antibodies. And that's when it attacks that cell, or that's when it starts initiating and activating the whole system. This concept of tolerance is really important and it's gonna come into play when we're talking about cancer later. So let's talk about how this goes wrong when we wanna talk about autoimmunity. So the easiest way I can break it down is this really awesome comic cartoon where you can see that it basically just turns on itself and then every other immune cell turns on it as well. So we don't entirely understand how you stop recognizing yourself. We have a bunch of guesses and we have a bunch of disease processes that we understand fit into certain categories. So notice that there are two different options here. We could have a problem with the immune cell itself, right? Either the T or B is not recognizing or over-recognizing what it shouldn't. But we also could have a problem where it's not the immune cells fault at all. You could have one of those passports that have gone wrong. So let's talk a little bit about each of those categories. So if the problem is with the T cells, let's say, for example, one of its receptors or recognition of the passport is wrong and it's coded wrong that way and somehow it got out of the bone marrow, that could cause autoimmunity. What about different pharmaceuticals? We know that certain viruses or pharmaceuticals do change our body proteins, that's how they work. So maybe they have unintended consequences in some people. Again, we don't know why, but we do know that some pharmaceuticals, some toxins, they can actually change and warp those proteins and that can cause a problem as well. What about different stress activates like radiation or other faulty genes that can then warp the receptor? And again, it's going to activate under wrong circumstances. And let's talk about B cell antibodies gone wrong. So B cell antibodies are actually, um, there is some randomiz random randomization process involved in the creation of B cell antibodies, especially when we're young. And one of these random mutations could accidentally get a little too close to our body's cells. Um, we could also have that anti-self, um, the immune tolerance process that's not working. Um, and it lets out one of those B cells that is reacting or recognizing the self passport. That's definitely one of the processes. And again, we have all kinds of drugs and radiation, genetics, infection, even some dietary factors that can affect our T and B cell activations. Now, what about if that passport is wrong, right? So sometimes one of the most famous that we always talk about is something called molecular mimicry, where a virus or a foreign substance looks very similar to a body antigen. We're gonna talk about some examples of that in a moment. But we can also be exposed to things like um, drugs, radiation, cancer, stress, whatever else that can change the body proteins on accident and it makes them unrecognizable. So the immune cell is doing what it's supposed to do. It's the protein that's the problem. We can also have these randomized B cell mutations that look a little bit too similar to the body cells and your body will then extrapolate and say, well, this one was bad, so we think this one might also be bad. Um, this 
two different processes that I've put in place here are also some of the reasons why um, we understand that multiple organ systems could be involved. So if it's a problem with the immune cell all by itself, that immune cell could be in any organ system possible. So you could have a very complex, wide variety of symptoms that are really hard to diagnose and very frustrating for both doctor and patient. Whereas if it's a problem with the passport itself, it probably just stays in one body tissue in one system. And this is why those tend to be easier to recognize and easier to understand. So here's an example of two different tables and lists. One is T cell mediated diseases and one is B cell mediated diseases. Now these are the ones that we know about. These are the ones that we spent a long time studying and can clearly and definitively talk about the different disease processes and how they're different. We have tests for them. We have medical models for them. Remember that there are still probably some autoimmune disorders out there that we don't have names for, that we don't have tests for, that we don't totally understand. So you can have the B cell mediated ones. Notice that lupus or hemolytic anemia, Graves disease, a lot of these are ones that we study a lot. The T cell mediated ones are ones that tend to have a little bit more dire consequences like type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's, that kind of thing. The good news is, is that we don't typically have to diagnose these in the emergency department. So this is just to understand the differences. It's not necessarily to memorize. Now I do wanna use an example so you understand the different uh, categories that I've made here. Um, the first and probably one of the most common or most famous is that Campylobacter jejuni, which is a bacteria that can cause uh, diarrhea, somehow has some protein inside of it. When it infects the body, your body does a really good job with its immunity and it attacks those cells. It gets rid of it. You have diarrhea for a while. You don't feel great. And then you're fine again. This is typically not something that requires antibiotics and it's a relatively mild disease course. However, we know that what's gonna happen is those T cells that are killing those infected cells are gonna take little tiny passports to the B cell and that B cell is going to make antibodies. And that way, if your body comes in contact with Campylobacter again, you're not gonna get quite as sick and your body will be ready with all those antibodies to get rid of it. Now, this normally works in healthy cells, but for some reason, a certain portion of the population will develop antibodies against the myelin sheath cells in around your nerves. And what we have determined is that there's a few proteins where when those T cells kill those infected cells from Campylobacter jejuni or the bacteria itself, if it happens to grab the wrong fragment of protein and show it to the B cell, and that B cell then makes antibodies to that one protein. And remember each individual cell has literally hundreds or thousands of proteins. So it's almost a luck situation we're thinking. So it's grabbed the wrong protein that just happens to look like the exact same cell our myelin sheath does. Now it's gonna make a whole bunch of autoantibodies against the myelin sheath. This will then cause a sitting paralysis that then becomes Guillain-Barre syndrome. When I've seen these patients, they wake up one day after having diarrhea for a couple of weeks and then they're fine for a couple of weeks. Cause remember our long-term immune system takes days and months to work. It's finally produced a whole bunch of these antibodies and then boom, they wake up one day and they can't walk. They can't wiggle their toes. They have very decreased, if any, reflexes, that kind of thing. Now, the interesting thing about this autoimmune disease is that after a few weeks, your body somehow realizes that these antibodies are not what they're doing, what they're supposed to. And so these B cells die off and the patient gets better and they're able to move and walk again because their myelin sheath cells then remake themselves. Let's use another example that doesn't get better. That's lupus. Lupus has an immune cell problem where the antibodies are against the DNA of the cell, a particular part of the DNA. 
And we're not 100% sure which exact part, at least not now in the research that I found, but it depends on which part of the DNA and where that part of the DNA is displayed the most. And it just wreaks havoc on the body, which is why it, it's very famous for having all different kinds of symptoms. It's called the great mimic and it can present with any symptom at all because all of our cells have DNA. So it could attack at any time in any place. And this is why it was so hard to diagnose for house on that show. Now it's not enough for you to have an auto in a body right? An antibody against yourself or self-reactive T cells, because we have tested people's blood and sometimes they do show autoantibodies or self-reactive T cells. You also have to have symptoms on top of that to be diagnosed with an autoimmune disease because you got to have both, right? So once you have both and then you have an autoimmune disease, your immune system has learned to attack itself and some sort of regulation process is not working the way it's supposed to. So once you have one autoimmune disease, it's very easy to get another autoimmune disease. And we see this very commonly in the emergency department. And I'm sure that our friends in internal medicine and family medicine also see this. So if somebody comes in with an autoimmune disease, you can always put on your differential another autoimmune disease because they can come together. Now, most autoimmune diseases are managed with immunomodulators. Immunomodulators are what rheumatology puts um, all of our autoimmune patients on. Um, immunomodulators are a wide category of pharmaceuticals, and I'm not gonna go really deeply into this. The category of immunomodulators I want you to know about the most is something called a monoclonal antibody. So monoclonal means that one particular type of B cell has made it, and they're making the antibody uh, uh, against that one particular thing. The fact that monoclonal antibodies exist is a big deal in medicine, because what we've done is we've used the immune system, we've enhanced it, and we've used it to solve the problem of autoimmunity. Now, almost all autoimmune antibody medications are given the ending MAB or MAB. You can see a little list that I have included in this chart of all of the different MABs. This is not an exhaustive list, this is just a few. You can see that a lot of these MABs are used in autoimmunity, but you can also see that some of these monoclonal antibodies are used in cancer. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. You also need to know that women are more at risk for um, autoimmune disorders. Now, unlike something like heart attacks, unlike all of the other disease processes where when we say they're more at risk, it's usually like by 10 or 12%, a little bit more in men, a little bit more in women back and forth. It's not a huge number. When we're talking autoimmune diseases, however, we're talking a huge number, we're talking 80% of people with autoimmune diseases are women. This is a huge discrepancy, okay? So this is like saying that women are more at risk of pregnancy, right? This is a huge difference. And this very fact has made us understand that women's immunity is significantly different than a man's immunity in some certain way. Now, there are a lot of theories about this, and this gets really into the weeds, but it's very exciting because understanding that a woman in her immune process um, is way different, we think has a lot to do with sex hormones and the fact that she can become pregnant. Now, there's actually a really popular theory that came out in 2019 called the pregnancy compensation hypothesis. And what it says is that during pregnancy, hormones decrease the immune response to protect the placenta and the fetus. So that way her body doesn't attack it. But the immune system has to compensate in some way because we can't have a species if every pregnant woman gets sick with the flu and dies because they're trying not to kill the placenta and the fetus. So 
what, what they're thinking is that whatever way this immune system ramps up, because women are not getting pregnant as often, the immune system is kind of getting bored and it doesn't have as many hormones to kind of counterbalance this regulation. And so it starts creating autoantibodies. Um, that's one of the few theories out there that kind of tends to make a little bit more sense. A lot of people are having a lot of interesting studies about that right now. We also had a study in 2018 that did come out with saying that testosterone is proven to increase the number of your B cells. And we really don't know why, but we did prove it. So we are starting to find some significant differences in immunity in the different sexes. We did add a YouTube video that's only about, I think, 15 minutes long on a bunch of the theories that are out about why women are more at risk for autoimmunities. There's a bunch of cool stuff out there. So go ahead and check out that YouTube video if you want. Now let's talk about flare ups because this is really where we care about autoimmune diseases in the emergency department. Because remember, we're not diagnosing these most of the time. We don't have the ability to run all of those tests. What we're going to do is we're going to end up having somebody who already has diagnosed autoimmune disorder and they're coming in with a flare-up. So most autoimmune symptoms come and go. Um, seems like the immune system is waxing and waning. And when there is a large system inflammation and response, that's when we get a flare-up we see a lot of different kinds of flare-ups. Some people say asthma exacerbations are flare-ups. We see things like type 1 DKAs, and we see Crohn's flares, and we see um, MS flares. Some people notice that certain flares have triggers. Things like somebody who has got an infection is more likely to have DKA, just like somebody who has a urinary tract infection is more likely to have an asthma attack. Some of these have triggers and most flares are managed with steroids, which is a really good thing for the emergency department because when one of these folks comes in with a flare up, we know how to treat. Notice that there's a little graph here that tells um, some information and it is a little bit older. I think this was a 2015 study, but it was showing how long the latest relapse or exacerbation lasted. And most people's exacerbation lasts about one to two weeks with steroids. Now, here's a whole bunch of lists in um, this table down below of well-accepted causes of flares. Notice that most of these are things that cause known immune changes in our body, things like emotional stress. And we're talking about that extreme kind, the kind that causes anxiety, the kind that can cause herpes zosters infection, for example, or infection, some kind of large medication changes, some sort of trauma, some sort of hormone imbalance, any of those kinds of things changes the body's environment and therefore is more likely to cause a flare up in our autoimmune. So once we have a patient who's standing in front of us in the emergency department with an autoimmune disease, you always want to add a flare up to your differential diagnosis for this patient. But remember that it's only one of many differentials. Not everybody with an autoimmune disease is having a flare up. So you need to do your part and rule out other differentials. You also need to determine if a flare up for that person's particular disease is life threatening. If it is life threatening, clearly that person needs to be admitted. If it's not life threatening and it's just uncomfortable, then this person is more likely than not going to be dischargeable. You also want to ask a lot of extra questions in the emergency department. Things like, is this usual for your typical flare ups? Or have you had this kind of flare up before? You can always call or refer to a rheumatologist, which I highly recommend that all autoimmune disorder folks have. Um, and I've listed here a little table. This is one that I just created so you could understand that there are some life-threatening flare-ups and there are some dischargeable flare-ups. For example, somebody with an IBS flare-up, irritable bowel syndrome, even though it's uncomfortable and they may be having diarrhea and they may be having belly pain, that's not something that we're going to be admitting them for unless they're so dehydrated from their diarrhea. 
Same goes with psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. And even though all of these things are very painful, these are all things that can get a little bit of steroids and go home. Things that are life-threatening that you have to pay attention to are things like temporal arteritis, which causes blindness. Things like DKA, we know that those patients die without help. That's why we admit them to the ICU. What about people with Addison's, Cushing's disease, or Hashimoto's and Graves? Remember that those vital signs are gonna be crazy out of whack, right? People with thyroid problems may or may not have fever, or they may be really bradycardic. They may not be able to get up and move, or they may be bouncing all over the walls. These are gonna be very big deals. So we do admit for abnormal vital signs and you need to watch out for those patients. And then we also have people who have MS or myasthenia gravis. So that's multiple sclerosis or myasthenia gravis. Notice that they're both MS. Those are the inability to function because they can't move their muscles or because they're having stroke-like symptoms or that kind of thing. Usually these patients get admitted until we can let them go home to take care of themselves at home. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about what you need to know about steroids. So I apologize, this can get very complicated, but let's go into the different kinds of steroids. Know that we're not talking about sex hormones, which a lot of people call steroids, like testosterone injections in the street. We're talking about steroids like mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. So in the adrenals, you make those two kinds of steroids. Mineral corticoids tend to regulate your water and salt. So think about salt as a mineral. This, the best example of this is gonna be aldosterone. And then we're gonna have our glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids very helpfully in the name tell you that they're gonna help us regulate sugar and the immune system. So one of the best examples of that is cortisol. Now, I also have to list here that some patients do come into the emergency department and then they say that they're allergic to steroids. Um, steroids are required for life, like function. So if somebody tells you that they're allergic to steroids, that's not true. Now, what they can be allergic to is some of the preservatives that are placed into some of these pharmaceuticals. For example, prednisone is a very well-known chemical that has a specific preservative in it. So people can be allergic to prednisone, but they're not allergic to steroids. They're allergic to the preservative placed in the tablet so it doesn't rot, right? So I've listed here a ginormous table for you of the different um, mechanisms of action of whether something is a glucocorticoid or a mineral corticoid. And notice that a lot of these steroids have both actions, right? So prednisone, for example, is mostly a glucocorticoid, but it does have a little bit of mineral corticoid action. So that means that if somebody gets prednisone, while they can also get really weird fluctuations in their sugar and their immunity, they can also get a lot of water and salt retention because it does have mineral corticoid action. Now, let's talk about cortisol and adrenaline. This is an important factor because this is most of what we prescribe in medicine is glucocorticoids, right? So it's gonna have cortisol-like effects. And I want you to understand that adrenaline, which is essentially epinephrine, is something that's very short acting. Think about that feeling that happens when you're driving down the road, not thinking about anything. And then all of a sudden you see those blue and red flashes right behind you. You know you're about to get pulled over and you have that instant spike of, oh shit, I'm gonna get pulled over. That's gonna be the adrenaline that kicks in or the epinephrine but it goes down after you realize, oh, he's after somebody else or after you've been pulled over. So adrenaline doesn't spike for long periods. It's very strong, very efficacious. That's why we give it in codes, but it doesn't last very long. Notice that cortisol, however, is a slow going, slow burn, but rises very steadily and can last high for months or years. This is when we talk about adrenal burnout when somebody is so stressed out all the time that they're releasing cortisol all the time and it never lets anybody get any rest. It doesn't let you get sleep. It's up all the time, okay? That difference is going to matter when we're talking about side effects. 
So let's talk about what steroids do in the short term and in the long term. So steroids are going to be reflected in that epinephrine. So we're imagining that we're running from a lion. If you're running from a lion, biologically, what do you need to survive besides really good muscle strength and the ability to run fast for a long amount of time? What you want is you want to increase your white blood cell count so you're ready for an injury in case that lion scrapes or scratches you or you fall to the ground. We want to be ready. We also want it to be the ultimate anti-inflammatory, okay? We can't be worried about having some inflamed left toenail while we're running from this lion. We need all of our energy and we need all of it now. So that means that we need to break down some of our protein and some of our fat into sugar for energy. We need instant energy so we can run far and we can run long. We also need to stimulate the brain to suppress sleep. So that means that we got to stay awake. We got to keep running. We're going to be active and super alert. I'm sure that you've heard the stories about soldiers who are constantly chronically stressed out with cortisol, people who may not have to sleep for days at a time because they're so on edge. That is the effect that steroids have. We're also going to get some intense focus. Um, steroids can have a very intense um, change of the lens and the eye because we're wanting to look far ahead. We want to make sure we have the sharpest vision possible right now so we survive right now. High blood pressure, which is also going to allow us to run at any moment. If our heart, if our high blood pressure and our heart rate stay high, we're ready to get up and go. We're constantly alert, we're ready. And then it's also going to decrease our histamines and prostaglandins because the last thing we want to do is get eaten by the lion because we're having an allergic reaction to hay, for example, right? We don't need to be having problems breathing. We need to be able to run. That is another reason why we use steroids with uh, allergic reactions. So all of these responses you can think about are the steroids getting us ready for the short-term emergency right here, right now. None of these things are expected to be going on for long-term. That comes into play when we talk about our steroid side effects. So remember how we have to have these really intense vision? Well, if you're on steroids for a very long time, that's why we can have problems with our vision. It can cause things like glaucoma or cataracts, even in young patients. Notice that because we're activating all of these body responses, we're having sleep disturbances and mood disorders. We're constantly on edge and very, you know, irritable. It also pulls all of the energy out of our storage and puts it so it's ready and active in our body. So we can get things like osteoporosis because it's pulling all of that energy and all of that stuff into your bloodstream to get it ready. And if it's going on long-term, we can't build up our bones. Same is gonna go for eventually causing diabetes because it keeps putting the glucose into the blood, getting us ready to run from that lion. If that's going on and on for a long period of time, eventually that's gonna give us diabetes. You can read an entire list of this entire slide. You can see that it causes things like poor healing and making us susceptible to infection because after a while, nothing can stay on high alert all the time. Remember that it suppresses the immune system as well as gets it ready. So there's this weird balance where the steroids can help in the acute immune response, but over the long period, it actually suppresses the immune system. This is where it gets different in the immune system. So steroids, when we're talking about short-term flare-ups, we wanna use short-term steroids. So that way we suppress the immune system for just a little bit, but we don't wanna put them on long-term without understanding all of these steroid adverse effects. Um, this is Cushing syndrome. This picture here um, shows you what happens with long-term steroid use. Cushing syndrome is when your um, adrenal glands make too much steroids. But remember that we can do this iatrogenically, right? When we prescribe steroids for long periods of time. Now, when we're talking long periods of time, I'm talking months and months and months, six months, nine months maybe a year. We're not talking two weeks. We're not talking three weeks. We're talking very long periods of time.
There's also this mnemonic over here called glucocorticoids, if you'd like to remember all of the big side effects of steroids. But remember that these side effects are time dependent, right? So your glucose is going to go high after just one day of steroid use. However, you're not going to develop diabetes after just one day of steroid use. You won't develop diabetes after two weeks of steroid use. So remember that these are all time dependent. So I also want you to understand that steroids do end up with a withdrawal, just like any other hormone. If we supplement with steroids for probably about longer than a month or two, we're going to end up suppressing our natural steroid production in our adrenal glands. Those glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids that we were talking about, those are going to be suppressed because we already have so much in the bloodstream. And because they're suppressed, if you're on long-term steroid use, and the book I use to find this as over five months, a lot of people tend to get steroid withdrawal if they stop it suddenly or they don't taper it appropriately. Steroid withdrawal is going to be very similar to um, any other withdrawal. You're going to get the opposite effect. So you're going to get a fever. You're going to get low blood pressure. You're going to get some vomiting, some nausea, some headaches. It's going to be all caused by this negative feedback loop of the hormones. And don't get too stressed out about this, but understand that there's hormone feedback loops everywhere. And our body is trying to constantly remain in homeostasis. So whenever we add too much of one thing, there's always some kind of effective response. Now, for those of you out there who are going to do critical care or emergency medicine, and this is an emergency medicine talk, I also want to point out that steroid withdrawal is another way of saying that if you have a person who comes in in sepsis or in otherwise shock and they're not responding to fluids, always think about steroid withdrawal. Maybe this person is an asthmatic or a COPD who's been on steroids a lot of their life, or maybe they're an autoimmune disorder patient who have been on steroids for years, maybe even just low dose steroids. If their body kicks into even higher gear because of sepsis, because of shock, because of some other reason, their body's natural epinephrine can't kick in because it's been suppressed by the steroid use. This is why we use stress dose steroids in patients in the emergency department and the ICU for patients who have been on steroids for a long term. So before you start those vasopressors, especially in autoimmune patients, cancer patients, asthma exacerbation, COPD, all of those patients that are on steroid use, consider giving a stress dose steroid boost, which will often bump up the blood pressure and fix your hypertension before you have to give vasopressors. Okay. Let's talk about contraindications to steroid use, because I know a lot of people think, oh, let's give a steroid. Steroids are the cure all. I know that a lot of people are thinking that about COVID-19 right now. So the reason that you would not want to give steroids, number one is a fungal infection. I know a lot of people give a hydrocodone, which is a steroid cream to a lot of rashes when they don't know what to do with it. Remember that if this is a fungal infection, what it's going to do is it's going to suppress the immune system, which means the fungus is going to increase and build and get worse. So if you're suspicious of a fungal infection, do not give a steroid. You can see I've listed several others. Any parasite infection is also going to get worse when the immune system is respond, is depressed. So you want to not give somebody with a parasite a steroid. I would also include something called ITP, which you do not want to give steroids to. Um, there's several other, but those are the main ones. There are some relative contraindications, which means you have to decide how bad the risk benefit ratio is. So for example, somebody with uncontrolled diabetes, if their sugars are constantly 400, do you really want to give them a steroid and bump it to 500 or 600 and likely risk DKA? That's going to depend on why you're giving the steroid and how sick that person really is. Also, it's going to depend on how long you're giving them the steroid. Is it just a one-time shot or are you trying to give it to them for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? Is that worth getting and risking DKA for. 
Same is going to be true of patients who are lactating, who are breastfeeding, because we don't want to give a whole bunch of steroids to the, to the baby. Same with Cushing syndrome, their steroid level is already high. So we don't want to increase it anymore because they're already having symptoms of Cushing's. Osteoporosis is also another big one because if this person has already had three or four fractures because their bones are so weak. And then we're going to give this elderly person some steroids on top of that. They're more likely to have more fractures. All right, now let's talk a little bit about which steroids we prescribe. So I have listed for you this table over here. There are some short acting, medium acting and long acting steroids. Notice that a short acting steroid only lasts about eight to 12 hours, whereas the long acting steroid lasts about 36 to 54 hours. So we give dexamethasone shots in the emergency department quite frequently to children, people with sore throats, people with um, COPD exacerbations, that kind of stuff. Notice that dexamethasone is the most potent and the most strong so if you have somebody who has, say, diabetes, for example, or one of the relative contraindications, maybe you should consider giving prednisone instead of the dexamethasone shot. I also want to point out to you that solumedrol and prednisone are kind of on the equal ground as far as the potency and their duration of action. Whenever possible, though, if you look into all of the studies and um, all of the efficacies and benefit versus risk ratio, if you're only giving a one-time dose, why not give them oral prednisone? It's very easy to give, it's very easy to prescribe, and unless they're allergic to the preservative in prednisone, there's really no reason not to give them an oral dose unless they can't swallow. So I put a star next to prednisone and prednisolone is what we give to children. It's, it comes in the IV, but you can drink the IV fluid um, for children. And methylprednisone is the same as solumedrol, just so everybody is not confused about that. Now, there are several different ways you can prescribe steroids. So you can give them a one-time dose, oral, IV, IM, that kind of stuff. You can also give people long-term doses of steroids. And most people who are on steroids for long-term are on prednisone. And we're talking about months to years here. So if we want to talk about a burst versus a taper, this is also an important factor. A steroid burst is what we should be giving in the emergency department for autoimmune diseases. A steroid burst is an oral medication, usually 40 to 60 milligrams for about three to five days. It doesn't taper down afterwards. It's just a quick burst for a couple of days and then it stops. This is also what we should be giving for things like COPD exacerbations, asthma exacerbations, or even something like somebody who had um, anaphylaxis in the emergency department. A taper is something that goes on for about two to three weeks. It goes up and then after a couple of weeks, it goes taper, taper, taper. A medrol dose pack is an example of a taper. A taper is most commonly used for people who have some sort of chronic inflammation that we need to taper down. So we're talking about people who have sciatica, we're talking about people who have degenerative disc disorder, that kind of stuff. Most people do not need an actual taper. Most people are fine with a burst. And that's including the people who, um, you can give a steroid burst to somebody with sciatica or somebody with back pain and they work just as well. So there's a lot of argument right now in the medical community about whether we should just be converting everything to bursts and we shouldn't be doing tapers unless you're on long-term steroids. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, prednisolone is IV or liquid only. It doesn't come in as a pill. And you should know that we mostly give it to pediatric patients or to liver patients because of the way that it's metabolized. Oh, and here's a giant list of ways and reasons that we use steroids. I'm sure that you're used to many of these if you've ever worked in the emergency department. Now I wanna take you really quickly one step further when we talk about immunity into cancer. Now you have to go along with me here for a couple of slides because I promise you I'm gonna to get to the point where it all crosses over. So first of all, we have to answer the question, what is cancer? Now you may already know that, but the quick and dirty of it is, it's cells that don't play by the rules, right? 
So one cell mutates somehow for some reason. You can see that there's a large list of different reasons um, in the very bottom of the slide, mutations by radiation or toxins. It could be by cigarette smoke or simply the, the, it's old age. And I'm talking about the cell, not necessarily the person, but old people tend to have older cells. You get the idea here. There's also mutations by genetics. Um, most common cells that are more likely to become mutated are people are cells that have to replicate more frequently because they have to do the cell replication process more and so there's more chance of error. What about people who have chronic inflammation? If they're constantly cr trying to heal those cells, then again, there's more chance of problems with the replication and making new cells. There's problems with not enough nutrients or decreased regulation, but the long and the short of it is that there's different stages. So you notice that you could just have a mutated cell that hasn't done anything yet, or you could have mutated cells that are starting to divide, but they haven't really done any damage yet. And then you could have these cells that are causing a big old tumor and disrupting function of whatever tissue that they started in. And then eventually you get to the end stage of this where that rapid unregulated cell that doesn't play by the rules has gone to other areas of the body. And eventually it's going to disrupt the function of those areas of the body. And pretty soon your body is filled with only one type of cell that really doesn't do its job other than re uh, rapidly reproduce and it's not doing what it was supposed to do, and it's not doing anything good that it, it was. So you can't have a whole body full of just thyroid cells. You can't have a whole body full of just lung cells, right? You need all the different areas of your body, and this is why cancer is so hard to treat. So a couple um, overarching factors of cancer that you need to understand is that because it's so rapidly producing, it's taking up all of your nutrients. It's needing more oxygen, more sugar, more electrolytes. And because it needs more, that's why one of the overarching broad symptoms of cancer is fatigue and weight loss. Because no matter how much you eat, it, that cancer is eating up all of your energy, all of your oxygen, and all of your fat stores so it can make more cells. So watch out for those two symptoms, fatigue and weight loss. And we're talking large weight loss. We wanna talk at least about 15 to 20 pounds in, in a month, although that's a very vague definition. So don't stand by that. I also want you to know that because it takes more nutrients, most cancer cells develop a way to get more blood flow to the area. So areas of really high blood flow are also areas that are very concerning for cancer. Now, this idea of high blood flow and high nutrients is actually something that we use against cancer in the diagnosis of it. We use a PET scan, which tags a bunch of normal glucose cells with dye. And then we release that into the system and we look at areas and do the big scan and say, which areas took up more sugar than it should. And that's how we find where cancer and where metastasis exists. Now, the symptoms of each individual cancer, how fast it metastasizes, how much it disrupts your life, your symptoms, your functionality, even how easy it is to kill or how, how hard it is to stage, all of that depends on which cell that started it, right? Is this a thyroid cell that went out of whack? Is this a lung cell that went out of whack? And the only way that we know that is to determine it by biopsy. So we have to sample the cancer or the tumor, we have to put it under the microscope and we have to identify what kind of cell it is. That's done by pathology. Um, I know that surgery can send things to pathology and I know that um, IR sends things to pathology. Notice that we don't really know 100% of what causes cancer. You can see a giant list of green boxes there that contribute to cancer, but ultimately it's going to be some kind of cell damage or it's got become unregulated in some way. So how do we go about treating cancer, which is our own cells that have decided to make a giant tumor of doing nothing without killing all of the other cells around it? One of the answers is 
besides the fact that it's very difficult, is to attack only quickly replicating cells. So that's where we came up with chemo, which is a poison that pretty much specifically targets very rapidly um, replicating cells. We know that their rap rapidly replicating cells are going to need all of that nutrients and all of that blood flow. And so it's gonna be a lot more vulnerable to poison, which is where we came up with chemo. We also know that targeted radiation at the site of the primary tumor also helps decrease all of that rapidly replicating cells. And some, some cancer cells respond really well to one or the other or both. However, the problem with chemo and targeted radiation is all of the innocent bystander cells that die also. So if you look here, I've included this chart of uh, many areas of the body and how fast they reproduce. So you notice that your eye cells, they're done by the time you're born. They don't really make a whole lot more. So they're not as affected by chemo and radiation as other cells are. Notice how fast your hair grows. Your, your hair is actually very rapidly replicating. And so when you take chemo or certain types of radiation, your hair is going to be affected and that's why it's gonna fall out. And that's why chemo patients typically um, had no hair or all their hair would fall out because it's a rapidly replicating cell. The same is gonna be true about the gut lining of your intestines. That is a very rapid, rapidly replicating area, which is why a lot of patients develop nausea, vomiting, and they can develop very extreme belly pain and diarrhea, some of it even bloody. So I'm not gonna go into all the differences, but that's what you should understand about chemo and radiation. This is also important to know because with chemo and radiation, you're gonna get a whole lot of nausea and you're gonna get a whole lot of dehydration because people aren't gonna feel well. They're not gonna to wanna to absorb or eat any food. So if a cancer patient, especially after chemo or radiation has come in to see you and they feel like crap, please consider making sure that they have some kind of nausea medicine and are getting some fluids. Now, this is where cancer and autoimmunity meet. So because we understood how autoimmune disorders and how dysregulation works, and we spent so long studying that, it actually helped us with cancer treatments. And this all lies in monoclonal antibodies. What we've done for cancer cells is we realized that instead of doing just chemo and radiation, we can now use monoclonal antibodies to attack specific cancer cells without as many uh, innocent bystander cells dying. So we take a bunch of B cells, we make them make a bunch of antibodies against whatever kind of cancer cell that that person has. And some cancer cells are easier to target than others, which is why we don't have a monoclonal antibody medication for every single cancer cell out there or cancer type out there. But we have many, and I've included a small list. Remember that is not everyone out there, but you can see that we have several monoclonal antibodies for colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and certain kinds of leukemia. I also want to point out this graph here. Notice that autoimmune disorders is in the red. We only use monoclonal antibodies for a small portion of autoimmune diseases. Now we're using monoclonal antibodies almost exclusively, or at least half, for cancer because of our understanding of the immune cells, this seems to work very, very well. You can see that monoclonal antibodies are also used in other disease processes as well, which is really exciting. This was a big step forward in our understanding of medicine and our treatment of cancer, at least in the last 10 to 20 years. Now, a couple of quick tips for ER providers on um, understanding and treating new cancers in the emergency department. Unfortunately, the reality is, as you can see from this graph, about 23% of cancer that's diagnosed, at least in 2018 in England, was in the emergency department. I would probably say that in the United States, especially in our ER system, we diagnose, I'm going to say a lot more than that. 
But that said, we see new diagnoses of cancer often in the emergency department. And most cancer is not an emergency, even if there's pain involved. Most cancers do not qualify for admission. And I'm sorry, I know this is a very hard truth, but in the United States, most oncologists will not see a patient unless they already have had a biopsy that shows cancer. And that's because there is a lot of tumors out there that aren't actually cancer. So they don't wanna waste their time seeing a whole bunch of patients with a tumor only to find out they don't have cancer. I'm not exactly sure who made this rule or why, but that's become the culture. So if you find a patient with new cancer diagnosis in the emergency department, you need to tell them that they need to get a biopsy first. And if you remember, there's only two specialties that are going to do your biopsy. It's usually going to be IR or general surgery. There have been a few pathologists who will do biopsies, um, but they usually aren't going to happen in the emergency room. Now, once your patient understands that they need to have a biopsy, that's when they can take the biopsy results and go to an oncologist who will then decide the best way to treat them for their particular kind of cancer. And they'll also try to do some staging and all that kind of stuff. Again, none of that needs to be done in the emergency department unless the cancer and where it is is causing life-threatening problems. Now, think about that usually that's going to be some sort of airway compromise, right? So a big mass that's pushing over onto the airway or obstructing somebody's breathing process, that's going to be an emergency. And same goes with brain tumors because the brain doesn't have a whole lot of room to move in that skull and you will die if your brain herniates, that is an emergency. But most other cancers just because it's a little tiny spot in the back of your throat, for example, that is not a reason to be admitted to the hospital, unfortunately. Now, this brings us to kind of the dirty part of medicine when we're concerned with cancer, and that is treating cancer is very expensive. It's the numbers are actually down here for 2019. You can see that chemotherapy can be up to $12,000, and that's with insurance. Same with immunotherapies, AKA those monoclonal antibodies we're talking about, those can be just as expensive as chemotherapy. And that's with insurance. Without insurance, many of our patients can't get a biopsy and they can't get access to, to medical treatment for cancer. This is just the true and down and dirty part of emergency medicine in the United States but each state Medicare, and at least in some of the states, each county determines who qualifies for indigent care and whether or not they qualify for chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, or none or some or all. And it is usually very hard to get on indigent care in a lot of these counties and a lot of these states. This is a very hard thing for a lot of emergency providers because I know that I myself have had to discharge patients knowing that this patient has new onset cancer, knowing that this cancer is one of the ones that responds to treatment, but this patient is never gonna get care and they're probably gonna die of this cancer diagnosis. I try not to be that blunt about it, but I also try to talk to these patients and make sure they understand the situation they're in and how important it is to try to apply for and get indigent care in whatever way that they can. Again, I would definitely talk to any other uh, provider about it, but this is something that I feel like our healthcare system in the United States fails at. Um, and I guess I'll leave that there. I also want to give some top tips for autoimmune flare-ups. Remember that you always need to include a flare-up in your differential, as well as the possibility of another autoimmune disease. Um, if a patient isn't a flare-up, because you've ruled out all the other differential diagnoses, you want to give a steroid burst. That's only three to five days of increased amount of steroids. And remember that a lot of these patients will already be on steroids. So if they're already taking five milligrams of prednisone, make them take 10 milligrams of prednisone for five days and then go back to their five. You can give patients bursts even if they're already on steroids. 
I also want to tell you, don't mess with the immunomodulators. I really highly recommend that a rheumatologist be the one who does that. And if they don't have a rheumatologist, please make a referral. Lastly, I would say that you need to remember that most immunocompromised or most autoimmune folks are immunocompromised. Sorry about that, especially if they're on steroids or immunomodulators. So remember to include that in your um, differential when you're looking for disease processes and dealing with patient complaints. And that ends our lecture for today. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, this is my website and podcast. So if you have any information, you can definitely get a hold of me here.